That's it. What's your best um, side? I'll, this is my side. Okay, that's my side. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Well, hello. Hello, Marty. Are you on your good side? Oh, it is such a thrill to be talking with <laughs> Amy Palmer. <laughs> a polar, like the bear. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Hi, Amy. Hi, Marty. How Let's you get doing? closer. Okay. What do you think? How's our, uh, how is, how's our volume? There we go. Test Let's turn one, it up. two, three. Testing, testing. Oh, yeah. okay. Let's see. Let's see. Hold on. Jeez. Oh, boy. Get... It's a whole thing. You know, it's, it's always these thing. things where I get distracted and I look up and think, gee, I got to get the neck done. You know? <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much uh, for coming here today. We're going to talk to Amy about her new book. Yes. And what's it called? It's called Yes, Please. And we'll... That's nice. Well, look, I'm a big fan, too. But Yes, Please, and we get a standing ovation. I don't get it. But, <laughs> but why Yes, Please? Well, I write in the book that there's this idea of yes when you improvise, you know, that you have to say yes to things. Improvisers here? Anyone? Right on. Um, and as I've gotten a little older, I've added the word please because I realize that when you say yes to something, it means you're not doing it alone. You're usually asking for help and wisdom and collaboration with someone else. So it's a saying I like to say a lot in my life. I just, um, I liked that it felt energetic and uh, just active. It sounds, it, it sounds also polite. It is polite, yes. Yeah. It is the kind of thing that I can, like the title I can tell my children. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it is, it, but it's interesting to figure out how to stay, how to say yes to things and how to say please to things without you know, um, so how do you get out of things that you don't want to do? I say no thanks. <laughs> well, that's the sequel. Yeah. <laughs> that's the sequel. Well, yeah. let's see well, how this sells. <laughs> <laughs> the film will be called No Thanks. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it comes from that place of, of I've, my life is where it is and the good things have happened to me because I've said yes, please. And, and why did you want to, obviously, the advance was huge, so that's yeah. probably the real reason. <laughs> but let's say you, let's just say, which you aren't, that you were giving all the proceeds to charity. <laughs> Why did you want to write a book? Well, um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I, what so, I mean so, by... So let me just be clear, it was the advance. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I try to do is, I'm kind of writing something like a, a missive from the middle. So this idea, I'm writing a book in the middle of what feels like my life. Uh, there's a lot of memoirs that look back and have real perspective over the, their career for 70 years, and there's a lot of young writers who are looking ahead to see what they want to do and be, and I feel kind of in the middle. Like, there's a lot of really great stuff happening, but I don't know if I quite have the perspective. So I'm writing from a, a person <laughs> with a little perspective. <laughs> <laughs> but a person who <laughs> who's trying to who's trying to figure it out as they go you know, along. You do want people to buy the book. I do. <laughs> I've been told that's important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's very interesting that I, I found it fascinating uh, in the book that it, I didn't realize that you're you were literally hired at the time, or you started literally at 9/11. Yeah, uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, I got hired in 2001, and then our first read-through was supposed to be September 11, 2001, and my first show uh, was two weeks later, the very famous, uh, iconic moment where uh, Paul Simon sang The Boxer and Reese Witherspoon was the host, and that was my first show, and it was very atypical. And it's nice to start SNL at a time when everyone's talking about comedy being dead. Yeah, and, and what, what, was the, what was the exchange between Lauren and Giuliani? Yeah, Lauren wrote that joke. Um, there's that great moment where uh, Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani comes up on stage and Lauren says, can we be funny? And Mayor Giuliani says, why start now? <laughs> <laughs> How did you get SNL? How does one get SNL? Well, um, I was working in Chicago and then moved to New York with my group, Upright Citizens Brigade, and did some. Thank you. And did some. I did a sketch comedy show on Comedy Central. 
in the late 90s, and all, a lot of my friends were working on SNL. And basically, it was like Rachel Dratch and Horatio Sands and Tina Fey kind of telling Lauren, you should check this girl did you, out. Did you have to do that classic, you know, where you do a lot of characters? You know, I had a very atypical, weird audition. Because I had uh, three seasons of characters, Lauren didn't really know what I looked like or sounded like as a regular person. So I did a very weird audition, which I don't even know how I, where I was asked to be myself. So I did like an update segment. Yeah, about, and I wrote it myself and about, it was about sports. I don't even remember. It's, it's hard to write a oh, book so, when so you don't you, remember. You, you were playing like one of the, the, because you would become the update person. I was playing, I was just doing it like what an, up, right. like me as myself, what I would be doing on update as a segment, not as an anchor. Just. Were you nervous or were you pretty sure you'd get it? Hmm. <laughs> I had a lot of friends on the show. <laughs> I did. And you and had photographs. I had yeah. photographs, yeah. yeah. Um, I felt both. I felt both. You say in your book, um, I'm going to read a quote. Oh, God. You say, he lowered me onto, no, that's the, <laughs> I'm not going to read that part. That's, 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 that's for the European sale. <laughs> now you say the book is an attempt to speak to the feelings of being young and old at the same time. What does that mean? Um, well, I feel like I'm at that point in my life where I have, I'm not old enough to have complete wisdom about what's happened already, and I'm not young enough to get away with kind of being cute and... Um, Oh, in I denial. think you're pretty cute. Thank you. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but uh, so it's this idea, I think everybody feels it, right? This idea that you feel like the best is yet to come, but also um, a lot of stuff has passed me by. And you're always, you can feel very, very old when you're young, and you can feel very young when you're old. And age is just this fluid thing that... Um, that you get to decide how you feel about but I think, it. I think it is a great time to write a book because a lot of people write books at a time when no one cares less. You know yeah, what I mean? Right. Do you want to hear about the silent era? No one cares. <laughs> no, one, no one wants to hear about the silent era. But Bush, yeah. you know. But right now, people are fascinated by you, and because you are, you do so many characters. People want to know about you. I think it's a perfectly timed Thank thing. Thank you. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that's who the case. was. Um, so you joined uh, in 2001, 2001, and who was in the cast? Who was? Who oh, was it was Tina Fey, Rachel Dratch, Maya Rudolph, Will Ferrell, Jimmy Jeez. Fallon, Tracy Morgan, um, uh, Seth Meyers, uh, Anna Gasteyer. Um, Oh God, uh, uh, Chris Kattan. It was like Chris that's, Parnell. That's it was a huge. Cast. It was a huge deep cast. And um, I mean, the first year I just spent trying to uh, figure out where the bathrooms were. Like just really trying to. <laughs> and they're hard. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're hard. hard. Yeah. They're hard to find. And, and and you know the the notorious rep of Saturday Night Live has always been a women's club. Mm -hmm. a I mean a men's club. A men's club. <laughs> or a women's club, or depending on <laughs> what you like. But. Did you find that? Did you find No, presence? I mean, I dropped into that show. I mean, everybody has, as you know, everybody has different experiences with that show. It's like a college, comedy college. And so when you went there, it might have been different than it was 20 years ago. And I was there when women like Molly Shannon and Sherry O'Terry and Anna Gasteyer and Tina Fey and Rachel, they were just like crushing. And Tina was running the machine there, and it just was well, a... She was already running the machine when you were there? She was not a... When I started... She was head writer, I think yeah, she I was. Yeah, I think she was. Yeah. yeah, she was. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I got the job like most people do. I just slept with the head writer. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, no, that, it, that works. But... Yeah. <laughs> And then, and, and then, um, and, and of course, you were there at the most. In, you know, I, you know, Jan Hooks, the genius, the genius, the genius of geniuses. Beyond. Jan Hooks, beyond, always used to say the same thing that because um, I'd say to her, well, "Did you find it to be a men's club when you were there?" She said, "Not if you were funny. Yeah. If you were funny, and it seemed to be the." Way. Well, I was lucky in my career. You know, doing improv in Chicago, there was just this leveling thing. It wasn't really. It was like if you were funny, you were funny, and I mean, it was the same way when I was reading. Martin's book, which is also coming out. 
<laughs> I was reading an excerpt of your book and you were talking about working with Andrea Martin and, and Gilda Radner and this, uh, this feeling of just like everyone being together. It just didn't feel even back then. Like you just, you were funny, you were funny. You were yeah, funny. I think that, I think that that just cream rises to the top in that. And, and, and you did, you did, then you got to do this kind of iconic, I mean, when I think of Saturday Night Live in the last 10 years and it continues to, to, to boggle how it just continues yeah. and bubbles yeah. up, but the whole era of Hillary yeah. and Palin was like, <laughs> literally breathtakingly not to be missed. Well, it was what was cool was when I started the show in 2001, I mean, really, genuinely, people were talking about, will we ever laugh again? Really, I yeah. mean, and it was like, how can we ever watch comedy again? And how can we ever do anything about politics or, or the president? So if you, if you guys remember, in the early 2000s, Will Ferrell had just left, who did an amazing Bush, but then we kind of couldn't figure out how to even do Bush for a while on the show, because it was just so sensitive. The news sucked so bad. Every day was terrorism and, Hurricane Katrina, and it was just like, and so there was a lot of pop culture stuff in the beginning of my career at SNL, and it was really nice to go full circle, and at the very end, get back to doing politics. There was this relief that you could start to skewer the people that were running for office, or you know, embrace them, whatever, however you look at it, and the fact that the, the, the country was paying so much attention everybody was really paying attention. I mean, we did a joke about Dennis Kucinich's hot wife. <laughs> and people knew and I played that was. Dennis Kucinich. <laughs> and, <laughs> that makes perfect sense, right, casting-wise. And Kristen Wiig played the hot wife, which all makes sense. And um, <laughs> and uh, and you know, and people knew what that was. I mean, it was like it was like a sporting event. Everybody was treating politics like sports. Well, not only that, it was like once it got into, I mean, the, that scene with you. And, and, and Tina as Hillary and, and Palin was like the Super Bowl. That was like the moment everyone was waiting for. Who wrote that piece? Seth Meyers wrote that, um, yes. And um, Tina and I kind of punched it up with him, but Seth wrote it. Mike Shoemaker, the producer, wrote the famous I Can See, I Can See Russia From My House. <laughs> he wrote that line. and. Um, that was one of the rare and rare examples because I don't th I think this has maybe happened one other time where I actually was performing something, and I was like, "Oh, this is really big." I, you know, I, I think yeah. you never really have that moment where you're doing something and you think it's going to be. You kind of hope it'll work. And but this that was for many reasons, mostly that are covered in Tina's book, um, "Bossy Pants," which is you should still get. It's amazing. If you haven't read it. Is, um, is, was just the expectation of Tina playing Palin was so exciting. Because yeah. people were like, she, she looks like her, she looks like her. <laughs> <laughs> and I was six months pregnant, so uh, you know, poor Hillary had to like, watch this like, pregnant person play her. <laughs> um, and I remember they made a special jacket to cover my stomach, and I was behind the podium, and my Archie, my boy at the time, was doing flips in my stomach as we were doing the scene, and I was just like, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. And, and, and had you met Hillary? I had, many times before. Three, three what, times. What, 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 what's, yeah. <laughs> three times. Uh, in the two, in the, when she was running for um, a senator, I, when I was, before I was on SNL, I did a bit for her with the Upright Citizens Brigade at a, Function that Harvey Weinstein threw at like Roseland Ballroom, and we did some kind of interruption bit, which I'm sure was, I don't, I just don't remember it going well. <laughs> um, and I took my picture with her and just kind of stood next to her and just stared at her. And then I met her uh, one other time at an event. And then when I, when she came on and did uh, something on SNL, and we did that kind of classic thing where we were both dressed as each other and stood yeah, next yeah, to yeah, her, yeah. which is always strange. And, and so when you do someone and they're there. I mean, obviously, doing these people's like a Hirschfeld sketch, you're exaggerating yes. some of their flaws. Yes, and I don't do impressions very well. So, no, they know, but the, the point <laughs> is... <laughs> no, but I mean, do, do, you, do you pull back mm. because she's there and you're not gonna push something that you maybe would do if she wasn't there? That's a good question. I think yes. I think yeah. you do, 
there, there is the trick to SNL is that everybody is a guest. And you know, like you can't, even when you know, Governor Palin was on, you can't, you can't treat someone rudely when you're in their home. They're no. coming on no matter what their politics or, or like you have to kind of, they're, they're, they're game. And, and they are humans. That's I right. I mean, even, even, <laughs> even like Governor Palin, of you know, course. I mean. I mean, I, I give Governor Palin a lot of credit for letting me rap in her face. Like, that's really, she Yes, yeah, so that was the weirdest thing. I mean, so did you have to pitch that rap? I did. Her? I went into, Seth and I were, I was so pregnant. I gave birth six days later. And I, <laughs> I, we, I, and I was just like, you know, we, were, we knew she was going to be on. And Tina was going to do a great scene with her. And we were like, what should we do for update? I don't, you know, like. And, you know, because update sometimes is the thing that's like, well, everybody's covered it. What, what do we do? And um, I had, came up with the idea. I was like, it'd be funny if I, like, I don't know, just do some, like, hardcore rap dressed like, like, dressed, pregnant like this. And um, we went in and, and, read, and we had to show it to her. Uh, and um, she really only had one change. What was that? Um, there was, like, kind of a joke about uh, Todd, her husband Todd, being kind of a ladies' man. Yeah. And she was like, you know, I'd rather you not do that. And we were like, of course. And then, you know. <laughs> why, why, did, why did she do the show, do you think? What did you, she Because did? back, you know why? Because you had to then. It was, SNL was so, uh, it was so uh, plugged in to that race that you kind of couldn't say no. It was really exciting. Everybody came by, you know, even President Obama came by. And, Everybody had to do something on that show. Uh, it was an exciting time where that show and the, and the race kind of plugged in at the same time. So I think, you know, I think she did it. And, you know, Senator McCain had come and done it, and I loved working with him. Yeah. And uh, he was a lot of fun. And uh, so I think, you know. He is. He is, actually. He is. He's, he's, I mean, he, he's a brilliant guy, and he's had a long history. But it's astounding when you meet him. I remember meeting him in 2005 at Senate Live, and thinking, he'll win. Yeah. Whenever we, when he chooses to run, he'll win. He's that charming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then yeah. he picked Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a close race. Like, you know, for a while, if you guys remember, she, she was on the show, I think, a week or two before the election, and as he was as well. And it was, it was like a really interesting time where, you know, no one really knew how it was going to go. Right. So right. it was ex really exciting. And so let's talk about a little bit about, because this, it is this weird thing. You say you gave birth six days later, and I'm sure some mothers out there are saying, how is that possible that you could be doing something as, as high profile and stressful as Saturday Night Live six days before birth? How did you find that energy? Well, I would conserve my energy like a bear. So I would, <laughs> I would for example, like when I did that pale and wrap, for the dress rehearsal, you know, you have a dress rehearsal, and then you have like a 45-minute break in between. You go into Lauren's office to get notes, and then I remember between dress rehearsal and I just laid in my dressing room and I was like, <laughs> and I just snored. <laughs> wow, like I that. fell asleep like a bear and Sexy. snored. Sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I have a really big snoring problem. Yeah. I actually do. You know, you don't have to reveal everything. Oh no. No, okay. no, no, no. Now wait a second, <clears throat> but but now was there ever? Oh, you, tell the. This is, a, this, this is a story that sounds truthfully like it's made up for fiction, and it is true. Tell the story about your doctor. Okay, my uh, wonderful obstetrician, who, whom I'll call Dr. G. Um, beautiful, wonderful, old. This is for your first son. My first son, yeah. Archie, yes. The boy who uh, was born six days later. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. G was a old um, Italian physician who famously delivered Sophia Loren's children, and so he's quite old. And um, <laughs> my, uh, yeah, my uh, kid's dad and I, uh, Will, used to joke that, like, I don't, is, he, is he too old? You know, we were a little worried. How old was he? And he was in his 80s, and he was just, he wore, which is 80s, 80 is the new 60, right? So, um, but he wore suits, and he was just so wonderful. He would say, like, only one glass of wine a night. Um, <laughs> So, uh, uh, Said the drunken 80 year old. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so, he would say things to me like, Your child is already so smart, I can tell. Um, he was just wonderful. Anyway, 
uh, I was, John Hamm was hosting Saturday Night Live, his first time, and I was just getting to know him, and we were doing a sketch, uh, a Mad Men sketch. Um, I was dressed in an old kind of timey wig and a big dress, and uh, I was huge. And I had, I was, my plan was I was gonna do the John Hamm show, and then I was due the next day. And it was an example of like, the beginning of what children do to you, which is they f up all your plans. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I remember saying to my doctor, Dr. G, like, well, I'm going to do the show, and then I'll come in on Sunday, and then maybe we'll deliver, like, Sunday, Monday. So, <laughs> so it's crazy. And I went to, uh, on a Thursday, I went, and nothing was happening. No, you know, nothing was dilated. No doors were opening. Everything looked good. I um, did the sketch, uh, I was shooting with Ham on Friday, and um, I, um, I called my doctor, because at the end there, you kind of have to call in every day, and his receptionist was crying. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, oh, he passed away last night. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so, I, so how many days before? Two days, well, I was due the next day, okay? So as, my first kid, I'm in a Mad Men outfit, <laughs> like a, you know, it's the 50s, you know. I turn to everybody and I just hysterically start crying. And a really pregnant woman crying is terrifying. Because <laughs> you're so juicy, tears just like squirt out. Like. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like a punchline to a joke. It's like, my doctor just died and I'm <laughs> due tomorrow. And John Hamm, come, who I just am getting to know, comes over and puts his arms, on, hands on my shoulders, and he's like, this is a really important show for me. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to get your shit together. <laughs> and I laugh so hard. I probably peed myself. Like I, because I believe that, and I know you've had this in your life, I believe that going from crying to laughing yeah. Adds like five years to your life. Absolutely. So in that moment, it was so funny. And so the whole day, I just walked around like, oh my god, oh my god. And then you know, I we worked until like two in the morning that night. And Maya and Fred were on the main stage doing some bit where they were pretending to be old people, <laughs> coming back and doing their characters. They were just doing, it, and I was just laughing and laughing and laughing. And then I went home. I watched my favorite TV show of all time, Law and Order. The bump bump happened at the beginning of Law & Order. My water broke and I <laughs> went to the hospital and so instead of doing the show, I delivered my baby instead. And who had taken over? Um, so that was the first time Seth did Update by himself. Uh, no, I don't mean the show, I mean your baby. Oh, my baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's the other thing that I haven't mentioned and you may have guessed this by now. Amy's an actress. <laughs> What do you mean, who had taken over? The doctor. The oh, doctor. the doctor! Who was going to deliver the baby? Oh, the doctor. Well, Will Forte did some of my no, sketches. No, 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 I'm not talking about oh, Will. Okay. I'm um, talking about you're about to have your first baby. His partner, his lovely partner, Dr. His lover? His lo not his lover, his lovely partner, Dr. Irving Buterman came and, and I met him. How old was he? He was... Uh, 72. He was 72. Uh, <laughs> but he came and um, he gave, uh, he delivered my baby the next day and I, I just met him. And uh, you know, ma, you know the, the lesson is, is a lot of people can deliver your baby. <laughs> it's true. It's really true. Most people in the hospital could do it. <laughs> you Except know, for Randy who works in the gift shop. Maybe Randy can't do it. <laughs> But other than that, everybody with some kind of uniform know how to do it. <laughs> Randy in the gift shop. <laughs> um, but, you know, speaking of Maya Rudolph, you know, Maya Rudolph, yeah. the genius Maya Rudolph, she yeah. has now had yes. four children. Four children, and she's had three of them at home. Three of them at home. With, uh, look, the crowd's like, no, no, the crowd doesn't even, look, the crowd's like, whatever. <laughs> this crowd's very young. Nobody, nobody's had any babies at home. No one has a baby at home. A lot of people do. A lot of people do. Yeah. It's so badass. I mean, I, I'm just in but awe. But why? I think that seems to me insane. Well, I write... Because what if something goes wrong? What are you going to do? Put them in the fridge? <laughs> Put them right in the fridge. Put them in the fridge. Just cool just, them And then down. you find your house keys in there, too, and you're like, oh, my keys. Oh, my God. Um, 
No, I, I write in my book about this idea about motherhood and birth and pregnancy and all this thing. My motto is good for you, not for me. So <laughs> good for Maya, not for me. Uh, no, it's amazing. Well, Maya is kind of that. Oh, she's. You know, her, her husband Paul will say that she'll like have three kids, pick up the fourth, vacuum. Oh, and she's, she's like. She is such a being. natural mother yeah. in every way. And she's such a wonderful mother. And um, it's an absolutely no surprise that Maya had those babies at home. I mean, yeah. she, I have to say, of all the people I've worked with on SNL, Maya was the most naturally fit, like the most natural fit for that show, because she can do it all. She's so right. funny. She's a wonderful singer. I mean, we would have singers on, professional big time singers on, and then Maya would sing in a sketch, and everyone would be like, Maya's better. <laughs> well, Maya's better. mother is one of the great singers yes. of all time, Minnie Riperton. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, so, so you also, in the, so, so, now you have a baby. Now you have two babies. Yes, two babies. And, and you, so you had go through two, two full SNL pregnancies. No, I had Abel when I was done with uh, the show and I was oh, on you're Parks. done with the show. I was oh, on Parks, Parks and Rec. Yeah. Just I just working. tried. <laughs> I've, I've, I've successfully had like a fat pregnancy face on television for like six years now. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, is, so many people obviously struggle with balancing all this, and you haven't seemed to struggle. Oh, huh? I struggle all day, every day. Well, that's what I want to get to. How yeah. do you, what do you do? Well, I, I, I struggle every day. I think every working mother does. I think every person who is trying to balance all those things, and I think the first thing you have to do is just realize you're just not going to, <laughs> you're not going to do it right, I guess. Is, um, Meaning that you just have to try to live, you know, as best you can and do as best you can. I do what I, I get to work as hard as I get to work because I have people who help me. I have, right. I have child care providers who help me take care of my children. I have Dawa, who is a Tibetan woman who uh, helps me take care of my children. And I have, I have, uh, I had Jackie from Trinidad who uh, helped me um, raise my baby. And, you know, I have help. I'm lucky to have it. I don't, um take it for granted, and I appreciate it every day. And uh, some people don't have that help. They have their families who help. They, have, they work much harder than I do. But I think at the end of the day, you have to just give yourself a break a little bit and just really not pay attention to anybody else's thoughts, opinions, or advice. Yeah, I totally agree. I, that's completely right. I remember I had, my kids were little, and a father who was older said to me, you know what, we do the best we can. I think we're most people do. We're doing the best we yeah, can. I think and most it's not going to be perfect, and no. that kills you, but what's, what are you going to do? Right, and I, I, I'm very lucky that I've gotten to do all these things at the same time. In this book, how, you know, one of the things that, that held me back, truthfully, from writing a book for a long time, was because I, I'm Canadian, and I, you know, <laughs> we're the aliens you don't deport. And, <laughs> and I, was, I was confused as to how much you have to reveal and how private. I, I tend to be a more private person, and yet you, it's your book, so you can't just create, if you could create such a wall, maybe you shouldn't write. How, how have you handled that privacy element in writing something like this? I've struggled with it. We talked a little bit about this. There is nothing in the book that I feel nervous about sharing or that I'm worried there'll be any blowback about. Now, I don't know if that means that you'll care less about the book, but... Um, and a, a straight-up memoir feels strangely um, uh, uh, premature for me. So I struggled with how to write about my life in an honest way without revealing too much because I don't really like to reveal very much about my right. life, you know? And so I evaded with comedy in a way, but I think at the end of the day, I think anytime you read someone's book, you wanna find, you wanna hear their voice. You wanna feel like they're speaking to you or that, that you're sharing something with them. And that was my goal a little bit more than like dishing the dirt, which I just don't really do in my life. So. Uh, I found it relatively easy to not overshare. I'm not a real oversharer, if that makes sense. But 
Well, that's, I, I, I found that too, that I just, you, you think that you have to tell those stories that, they're not even mean, they're just stories that happen in your life about someone who was drunk phoning at three in the morning who's famous, yeah. and then you think, no, you don't actually have to tell that. There are other stories to tell. I agree, and also I think that the, we're living in a world right now that's so intensely public, uh, you know, that there are times when privacy and mystery is valuable and rare, and so it's how do you struggle telling the truth, which I really did try to do, and also protecting the people that you love and the people that you hate. You right, know? because it is your story. Whatever you say, that's why I was interesting about, like, if you write, um, if, if you write something about your parents, it seems to me you have to run it past your siblings because they're also their parents, and whatever you write will now be the record. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't yeah. have that thought, but maybe I should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should, my brother should do a, do a pass. I don't know. It's, 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 you, yeah. you, I mean, Hey, talk about Jane Aronson. You talk about yeah. going to Haiti and, and this being a kind of a, what, a, a monumental experience? Well, in I your just life? told a, a, a story about, a to, you know, the juxtaposition of life and, you know, uh, uh, how sometimes my life can be very strange, as, as, as can everyone's. But uh, I was getting, preparing for the Golden Globes and also in Haiti doing service work with uh, Worldwide or Orphans. Uh, which is an organization that Dr. Jane Aronson runs, which, yeah, it's called WWO, and then I, I went on a service trip with her, and it was just a funny, weird combination of uh, experiencing my first third world country, real poverty, and, the, and getting up close and personal with the orphan crisis uh, in, the, in the world, and then also, like, texting about, you know, my fake teeth and my Mandy Patinkin bits for the Golden Globe, you know, just like having to just balance those two things. And uh, just frankly, the good reminder of, uh, of perspective in our, in our world and business. And that Dr. Jane, is, who's my friend, is a person who is, I mean, I'm attracted to really people who, smart, people who are smarter than me telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. So I am now drawn to people who are, have experience and uh, a path. And as you get a little older, you start to think about the whole world rather than just your own, hopefully. So she's kind of helped me start to do that. I think that it, it is interesting, you know, going back to personal stuff, it is amazing. It's, it just dawned on me that also this idea that we live in the Kardashian world, mm -hmm. where everything about certain people's lives are so... I have a chapter that, in my that book. That to yeah. not get into that is kind of, and also because you know, Kim Kardashian. We, I don't. Do you know Kim? I don't. I mean, I met her once. She's not the brightest. Yeah. You know. <laughs> she, she, uh, we were talking. She thought soy milk is Spanish for I am milk. See, so this is, <laughs> this is a, <laughs> this is a, not a, a brainiac, but. Uh, <laughs> She sees the yield sign, takes her clothes off. But you know, anyway, I, no, I can't. But really, but, but, but we, but, but it, I think it's wildly refreshing to read someone of merit who is discreet. Well, thank you. Um, I'm not talking about your book. I'm talking about my book. Right, your book. Your book is that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, your book is just filled with sex stories. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> From position, position this, this, position And then I did that. it this way, and then yeah. I took her this way, and then I went like yeah, this. Yeah. And then she said this, and I said no, and she said yes. She said, are you tired? I said, are you nuts? That should be the cup. You that's should, a, that's you a title. Know, you know what would be funny? What? If you wrote a sex manual called, are you tired, are you nuts? <laughs> how, how, what a, what a. What a, like a monster you are in bed, and it's yeah. just, it was just a bragging. Yeah. I, I want, I want yeah. to sell that book. I do in my book. I have sex tips that are real, that I believe are true, and that nobody can argue. Can we hear some of them? Oh, let's see if I can remember some. Um, uh, please don't make it last so long. We're really tired. <laughs> um, 
uh, uh, oh, they're kind of dirty, I guess. Uh, well, okay. but they're um, in the book. Uh, they're in the book. Uh, what's another one? Um, uh, uh, you tell me if you It reads better than me. You tell me if you'd had a stroke, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not prepared this is your to. Book. Not, oh, so you're, you're being a little. You, you're just, that one is. That one has you're a Catholic read. girl. No, I don't give a shit about that. Oh. I'm just saying. I want to be funny. I want. I don't give a shit about being dirty. I want to be funny. I'm not ready to make. Like, just read it. Just read that. That's okay. That, just that, read that, that part. I'm not sharing. Uh, but, but, oh, my point, wait, you said something about, oh, I have a book about technology. I have a, a, a chapter in my book called My Phone is Trying to Kill Me. And it's my belief that I think I'm not on social media, much to the dismay of my editors. Um, but, uh, hey, nor am I. Yeah, and we talked about selfies, yeah. and, and everyone's just like, everything is just like, look at me doing this thing. Like, look inside me. <laughs> and everything is like, this is me every minute. This is me every minute. And this is what I do every minute. And, uh, and it feels overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by it. So I... I, I just find it so... I can't... How can you read every tweet and then read a book? Mm -hmm. And read anything? I mean, it, it, it is... Like, someone like Steve Martin, who is a you know, started off and continues to be a kind of brilliant comedy writer. That's totally different. For me, tweeting would be pressure, therefore, because I'd think, oh, would I have to write something Me funny? too. I feel like you know? I would always... But I remember one time I was going to the, um, the Vanity Fair party, you know, the Oscar thing in L.A., and it was Steve, and he's just doing this. And I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just tweeting. I said, what are you, what are you tweeting? He said, I'm on my way to the Vanity Fair party. I want to meet Cher to get on a first-name basis with her. You know? <laughs> You know, if I could do that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, the funny people that I know that are on Twitter that are, that are joke writers, that's really satisfying. But the rest, because a lot of it is having to, like, retweet people. If you're an actor, like, it's a lot of, like, retweeting brags about you. It's really weird. Like, you were great in that movie, and then you retweet it. Like, look what he said. And <laughs> I, I, I just don't get it. And you have to do a lot of self-promotion. And I know, it, I know social media works, and it's amazing. And, 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 and also, Instagram and, and the photo and the pressure. I like when actors talk about the pressure of their followers. Like, I don't want to tweet pictures of myself all day, <laughs> but my followers need it. Yeah, they need it. <laughs> Well, I was writing in my book, you know, growing up, we would have a party. Imagine this, young people. We would have a party. <laughs> we would have a party, and during the party, we would uh, take pictures. But we didn't see them. So <laughs> the party would be over, and two or three weeks later, you'd go to a, like, a little man who lived in a little hut in the middle of your town. <laughs> and you would... Wait, you would was, it, was this in America? <laughs> That's in America. Wow. Like a photo mat. And you would hand him a ticket, and he would hand you back your party photos weeks later. And you would be the only one that had a copy of them, and you would be like, oh, remember this time. And you would like, already have the good feeling about the party. The party already happened, and you felt however you felt about it. And then the pictures, and you would just, the ones you didn't like, you'd be like, mm, and you would just throw them away. <laughs> and then you'd, of the 20, you'd keep three, and you'd put them in an album. And it was like 10 people saw them. And, and if you didn't like it, you threw it away. But more than that, your experience was separate from the photo. Now, the photo is the experience. Now, the, every moment has to be captured. Every, and I, I fall victim to this, just like everyone. Every moment is like, I, I, need, I need it, but it's happening, but also I need it. <laughs> and it doesn't exist unless there's a photo of it. And it's really like, um, it's well, really, that was the interesting we're, thing we're really fucked, I think. <laughs> OK. I was going to say that that's the interesting thing about the no, no, Joel, let's not clap for that. Let's not have that be the pull quote. Listen, about 30, 30 people of the 9,000 agreed with you. That's not bad. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the interesting thing about the Patriot Act, you know, that I want my privacy as we're, you know, photographing and sending out. You know, I could go on, but, you know, it's about... I mean, there, there is a part of you that feels kind of old when you start talking about this, because young people do, like, check out. They're like, uh-huh, what is it now? <laughs> um, where you, you know, you're kind of... But I, my generation is the straddle generation. I'm 42. I didn't have internet in college, and now I have internet in my toilet seat or whatever. <laughs> you know, like, it's so intense. <laughs> that's we, a, we that's really, a bad place to it. It's a bad place to yeah. put it. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I agree with the need for it. I just don't think you need it there. Yeah. In my toilet seat. <laughs> I think you're in your toilet seat. No, I disagree. Oh, well, then we don't have to agree. <laughs> um, 
uh, you talk about your divorce in this book. A and is bit. that a little bit? And you actually, comedically, there are some very funny things in this book that you say, like Louis C.K. noted, divorce is always good news because no good marriage has ever ended in divorce. Yeah, that's one of Louis's yeah, great jokes. Yeah, that's so smart. I mean, no one talks about relationship and divorce better than Louis C.K. And yeah. Louis was, a, was like a sponsor and friend in many ways. Um, I don't really talk about it because I, out of real respect for my my ex-husband and the, and the father of my children, and, and, and I also don't like people knowing my shit, but <laughs> I do write about um, going through something, you get such a perspective, and one of the things I write about is um, the books I would like to now write about divorce. Right. Um, I have them written down if you Okay, yes, remember. please, because I don't remember them. Well, um, the problem is you have to talk about other people. Well, I'm quoting you now. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is, I, 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 you know, okay. I'm doing so many of these. This is, you know. Did, uh, okay. did your, no, no. Um, let me remember. No, no, the, I, the, the question was, um, did, did it bother you when Mama drank so much? And I realized that's for Lorna Luff tomorrow. But today, <laughs> it's an old joke. Now, let's see. Okay, here's one. This book is a chapter. Fake smiling. Is that one? Uh, no. How important is it? Oh, that's, okay, that's back to Lorna. Well, wait a second. Okay, let me think about it. Yes, I know, I'm trying to remember. This is my first thing I've ever done for my book. I don't know. And may I add? Um, the last. The last. <laughs> um, uh, okay, here's one. Here's one. Uh, there, are cha there are chapters. Here, uh, the first one is Get Over It, <laughs> which is people really want you to get over things really fast. And it's not about them, so it, it, they get really bored really easy. And <laughs> chapters include... She doesn't cry enough. <laughs> he seems gay to me. <laughs> this won't get you out of a speeding ticket. Um, there's a, a one called, uh, Don't Worry, I Don't Want to F*** Your Husband. <laughs> that was it. Is, Elaborate on that one. Well, when you're a person, anyone divorced here in the audience? Oh, not many. Good for you. Congratulations. <laughs> so How young. How is that possible? Anybody married? Yeah. Wow. This is a young crowd. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, or an oral lonely crowd. Or lo <laughs> oh, lonely crowd. <laughs> I had a little something. Something's happening. <laughs> oh. uh, any, this is, you know, this doesn't have to apply to divorce. It happens to relationships. It doesn't you don't have to be married to feel this way? But when you break up, when a relationship breaks up, uh, a lot of times you're single again, and suddenly you're single in a world that you weren't for a long time, and. You're just, it's weird to be the, you know, uh, not having a plus one at a wedding or, and suddenly you get a vibe, like, you're like, you're back on the market and people are like, hi. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I don't want to your husband. Um, but that was one chapter. How about, and it's also, a little weirder it, to say it out loud than to read it. Here, go ahead. Um, but what about the guys who come on to you now that you're single? What's well, that like? I have a boyfriend. I'm not single, but um, no, but you didn't have a boyfriend right away. I did not. No, it was weird and fun, and 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 you know, uh, I've spent most of my life being single since you know I was married when I was 30. So uh, it's interesting. Any transition with relationships in general, you have to just like take, uh, you have to try to bring your higher self to any kind of moment, right? So um, I think you just, I don't know, I think there's, I think there's, I don't know, I don't know how to answer that question. What was it like to, when people hit on me? It, yeah. It was great. <laughs> and um, uh, hmm. we've just gotten the five minute Oh, sign. we could have gotten it right before that question. That probably would have been. No, right. no, no, you're doing fine. <laughs> okay. Um, but, 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 the, but, so again, here's the obvious question: Why do you think we should buy your book, oh, God. as opposed to, I don't know, Kim Kardashian's? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take that part out of the equation because I don't like the compares, the compare and disparity. Okay, then Chloe Kardashian. <laughs> No, okay, then why, okay, then drop it, absolutely. Why should we buy your book? Okay, because, well, I, I do have a 
notorious online shopping addiction that I need <laughs> money. No. Um, no, this is about no. money. It's about money. No. Um, why should you buy my book? I would like to think that if you're a person who is interested in the buzzwords, comedy, woman, mother, New York, uh, you know, improv, New York, Chicago, Boston, <laughs> a lot of sex, mm, drugs. <laughs> if you like any of those things. Loose. 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 Um, but I think, uh, I, I, I think, I, I don't know how to answer that other than I think I tried to come at it from a place of telling the truth about how I feel, not only really about my life, but just about things right now. And I think if you're a person who feels like they're at an intersection um, and in the middle, I think this book may speak to you, I hope. And I, I, I'd like to think that it feels like my voice. Can I say something? Yes, please. I don't know how to do this. Exactly. No, I know. And you're getting self-conscious and you shouldn't because I'll tell you why. I have read the book and I'll tell you what's amazing about it. It is exactly like talking to Amy right now. It is an absolutely your voice. You know, one of the great people in the world was Nora Ephron and Nora was a good friend of mine. And if you read a book of Nora's, um, it was like you were um, on a flight with her from L.A. to New York, you know what I mean? It was mm. just like her voice, and you know what I mean, and it was that rhythm that she spoke in, and this is exactly how the voice, your book sounds exactly like us talking here. Not the illiterate parts, but the, <laughs> but it sounds exactly your voice, and I think if you can do that, in, a, in anything, but particularly in, in a, an autobiography or a portion of your life biography, whatever you call it, I think that's a, it's amazingly important because then you feel that you're actually having a true experience, and that's what your book does. Thank you. That's a high compliment. Thank yeah, so much. that's why I would buy it. Great. Well, you'll get it for free. I'll get it for free? <laughs> yes. Well, Amy Poehler, this is an absolute delight. Thank I, you, Martin Short. Buy his book. He, yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Also coming Whatever. Out. Whatever. Whatever. Are you kidding? It's um, so good. There's so many good stories. No, no, no. Listen, um, this is about you, honey. Um, so anyway, thank, thank you, you for coming here today. Is it, now, is someone going to come and lift us out of our chairs and? <laughs> you know, they have uh, little motorized <laughs> things, and we. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Amy Poehler. Thank you so much. Uh.